Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to Bricks and Barrels Wine Wednesday yet again. I am so excited to have uh, somebody I'm really, really a big fan of on tonight, which is Kurt Shockland. And Kurt might not know it, but he actually was a huge part of why Bricks and Barrels started. Unbeknownst to him, but at the same time, I'll get into that a little bit later. As you guys are joining though, do me a favor, please. Grab a beverage, sit down, relax, and let me know what it is that you guys are enjoying. The other piece of it too, though, is I really want to know, um, guys, uh, what questions do you have? Because a lot of times people, they do Zoom calls, they do a, a lot of different types of medias now that, that let them do video chat like this. But at the same time, the best part about Instagram Live is that you guys get to interact. So please, I know that, that there could be some questions from time to time. Hey, should I comment? Should I ask questions? And the answer is absolutely yes, please. That's why I'm doing it this way. Last week, uh, I think it was last week, it seems like a lifetime ago, we actually did a trivia night and it worked out great because we were able to interact so well. So guys, while we're on tonight, do me a favor, please, please use the comment section interact with us, let us know what you're thinking, the questions you have, and we'll do our best to answer it. Not only that, but I did mention Trivia Night. Guys, uh, did you have a good time at Trivia Night last time? Ooh, what hair I have left is not going so well. Um, well, if you did, please know that we uh, are gonna be doing Trivia Night yet again. So not next week, but the week after that, we're gonna be doing Trivia Night again. So if you guys want, Please stay tuned for that in just a couple weeks. And then also next week, uh, we are finally going to be talking about something I know a lot of you guys have mentioned to me in passing and other things. Uh, I can't tell you that I get a lot of fan mail, but at the same time, people have asked me about organic biodynamic wines. I was able to talk about it while we were on Trivia Night last week, you know, the horns and the poo and stuff. Anyway, so we are going to be having one of the first organic and biodynamic wineries in California on next week. Ampelos Cellars is going to be on. The two winemakers have such a great story. Moving from the successful business hub of New York City out to California and starting a winery. Not only that, but because of a missed meeting, they actually avoided uh, 9-11 and being in the Twin Towers. So needless to say, guys, we're gonna have a great conversation tonight, but next week when we talk to them, I think we're gonna, I don't know, I don't wanna say we're gonna cry, but we're definitely gonna have some feels. There's gonna be some good conversations, not only about poop and horns, but also following your dreams and, well, everything else. However, all that to say, guys, <laughs> my daughter is on, you might notice, because there is a lot of emojis going on. Um, but guys, Tonight, we're gonna to be talking to Kurt. Kurt, Kurt Schachman has been, uh, like I said, an inspiration of mine, whether or not he knows it. Uh, when I do go to the coast, we stay at a place in Shell Beach. I end up over in Sands Lage Tasting Room over in Pismo quite often, as well as the Fablest and Groundwork and even Richfield Wine Co. have all been a part of Bricks and Barrel. But more than that though, I feel like he's just a fun guy where I've been able to interact with him a couple times, going to events and other things, and I can't wait for you guys to get to know him and taste with us tonight. So if you guys have it with you, please bring out some Fabulous wine, because this is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. It is one of the number one sellers that we have on Bricks and Barrel because it over delivers every single time. The prices are right around $20, but at the same time, each time I taste a wine from them, I'm like, this wine tastes much closer to $35 or $40 worth of wine rather than just $19.99. So if you guys are interested, take a look at Bricks and Barrel. We have a bundle going on right now, which is actually discounted less than $20 a bottle, and you get three bottles sent to you that we will hopefully have time to taste tonight. But anyway, enough, 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 enough. We have a lot of stuff we could talk about, but really I wanna to talk to Kurt. So I'm gonna go ahead and I am going to bring him on and start chatting with him. But guys, while I'm doing that, go ahead and let everybody know what you're tasting. Ah, uh, me, Fabulous. Kurt. Hey, hey. How are you doing? Good, how are you, Trevor? 
hey, I am doing really well. And uh, I don't know if you just saw that intro, but Kurt, did you know, uh, there actually there's no way for you to know this, but the Fabulous was actually one reason why I started Bricks and Barrel. I had no idea. But Which I, might I not be a huge compliment because I can't say that I'm actually like, wow, really? That's so huge. That's congratulations. But, um, but it was a wine tasting trip. I went with my friends and I was... I was legitimately pissed off that I had never heard of the Fabulous until I went out to Fasten. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Why don't more people know about places like the Fabulous, like Sands Liege, like, you know, all the things. And um, a couple of years later, I now have a wine business because I was so upset that one day. So thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if I could take any of that credit, but. No, you totally sure. can't. You're welcome. Was it, was it tin, uh, so you stopped by the Tin City location? I did. I don't think the other location down, because there's two locations of tasting rooms for the Fabulous now, right? Yes. So where, where are they? So we have the original tasting room is in Tin City, and it's within the same building, actually, as Tin City Cider, but it's right. just the tasting room. Right. So we were, you know, we were making the wines off-site and having the tasting room there, and then last year... We were lucky enough to get the lease on the property is formerly known as Pomar Junction. Yes. So we now actually have an estate property for the Fabulous. So yeah, we have a winery there, a taste room. We have a guest house. Um, we don't take all the fruit off the property, but we take about 25% of the fruit. We kind of got the cherry pick what we wanted. Nice. So yeah. That's awesome. Um, now, that location is kind of historic, isn't it? Like, I, I've heard of this before. Is, has there been, I mean, granted, I think historic, and it falls into, like, horrible tragedies, hauntings, and other things. Uh, has anything big ever happened at that location or around there? I don't know. I mean, I think, I feel like, I heard, like, there was a, there was a fire there. There was. The moved into it once burned down. Um, you know, it's called Pomar Junction because it sits in the intersection of Pomar and South El Pomar Road. Okay, gotcha. That's history there. Um, there is an old almond shack there. And from what we've gathered, like a lot of the local people would bring their almonds there uh -huh. and processed formerly. Um, okay, maybe. Yeah, but other than that, I don't know. You might know something. Okay, no, no, no. This, this really could be something that uh, I am just pulling out of thin air. But for some reason, I had thought, like, I had heard Palmar Junction a couple times uh, before. Uh, and you and I shared earlier where I am – not from the Central Coast, but I like to pretend I am because I went to Cal Poly. So, you know, maybe it's just because while I was there, I heard something at one point, but I could just be daydreaming. So, I don't yeah. know. Or it, there could be something out there. I don't there know. could be something out there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, maybe I'm, I have a sixth sense that I did not know about. I don't know. Yeah, I'm the new guy. <laughs> it's all relative, really. I right. think um, you still get I, – I think when learning about you, though, you get the original – uh, inhabitant, you know, or at least you were there before I was, I think, because you went to Cal Poly, didn't you? I did go to Cal Poly. Um, I think I graduated. My wife always makes fun of me because I'm so horrible with dates. Um, I think I graduated in 1997. Okay. Yeah, I think. Don't hold me to it. I'm maybe off by like one or two years. Okay. Yeah, so that works out. Um, but when you went though, like, did you go like, hey, you know what? I'm gonna go to Cal Poly and I'm gonna end up in Paso making wine, or did this kind of happen over time, like out of nowhere? Yeah, no, it kind of happened. Well, it did happen organically. So nice. I moved to San Francisco to go to Cal Poly, um, and I studied business there. No way! Yeah, you it was before it was called the Orfila College of Business because I went there and they had just switched over. Like I went to business school at Cal Poly as well. Yeah. Okay, so you got to think this is mid '90s when I was there. All right. Um, the enology viticulture program didn't exist at Cal Poly at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I wasn't even on my radar that I was ever going to make wine. I mean, I started learning about wine uh, in my late teens. I worked at Trader Joe's. And my bosses start teaching me about wine. That's um, awesome. Once a week, they do like wine tasting in the back room just for education. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of what started the curiosity for me. Early uh -huh. on, more of a beer geek and kind of like attacked yeah. beer like from this whole thing of like, I want to try all these. So my friends and I actually bought this thing called the Encyclopedia of Beers, which is yes. the time, all import beers, right? Because there's no, yeah. again, I'm dating myself. There, You know, the craft beer scene. Was it until like the 2000s or whatever? Totally. 
yeah, so we were hunting down all these cool import beers and kind of like, I think that's how my first like love of how beverages are made and differences. Yes. Started. We went through this book and then, um, you know, I was, I was learning about wine from pretty young age from my bosses yeah. and then moved and continued to work from Trader Joe's when I was going to Cal Poly and then started going wine tasting because I turned 21. I made some friends that made wine because it's a small community. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Started helping just like all my free time. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's how it all started. One thing led to another. And then, helping, so. so, okay. So you started at Trader Joe's as far as getting the bug. And then you were able to, you know, go through what would be considered the gateway drug of beer. And then once you skip a few, you now have how many projects going on for, I mean, in the wine world? Because I mean, I can think of at least three or four off the top of my head, but, but what do you have going on right now? Yeah, well, so the foundation brand is Song Niche Wines, which uh, the first vintage of Song Niche was 2006. Um, but within that umbrella, there is also the groundwork wines. Right. So Song Niche really has two brands and we differentiate it that groundwork is really about just kind of minimalist winemaking, mm -hmm. me staying out of the way and keeping it all about single varietals. Yes. Every wine is a single varietal and, um, you know, kind of a sense of place, central coast. Yeah. Some are vineyard designate, some are some blends, but, you know, keeping it about grapes in place. Totally. Salnese is a little more stylistic. Um, we get a little more picky on the farming. We drop more fruit. We chase a little more intensity in the vineyard. Uh, generally, you know, invoke some more blending, mm -hmm. more barrel aging. Um, yeah. It's a little more like winemaker voodoo, I guess, in Salnese, where <laughs> are, yeah, yeah. more just grape to bottle concept. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and then uh, and another thing we started with that umbrella about four years ago, we started a little can wine brand. That's what I want uh, to talk about. Yeah. yeah it's called Rich Vale. Yes. And uh, yeah, so that's just like the playful. Those wines are kind of made with the ethos of like, who is Kurt when Kurt's on vacation? And, uh, <laughs> Let me just throw this out here then, because like I, I have seen the artists that you chose to design the cans and I love his art. I, I, I can't remember his name off the top of my, uh, my, my head, but at the same time, like he is in my mind, like kind of that more like, Palm Springs style, like really, I'd say mid-century modern hotel, going on vacation, hanging by the pool, yet still wearing a Speedo while chilling in the pool. Yes. I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. So yeah. how you describe it's yourself? Neil. Yeah, it's Neil Breton, local guy. Um, and like you, I was a big fan of his art as well. And so cool. my wife and I got to know him. And uh, kind of this whole thing came together where I was like, I want to do a cam wine project just because when we take vacation, we usually go to like a beach or like a place where we're hanging out at the pool and bottles of wine just like really aren't super appropriate. We're taking no. the vacations because it just, you know, having glass around and whatnot. And I think a lot of times for wine, um, you got to get in two places. Sometimes you want to like drink it slow and really like pontificate about it. And like, enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, you just want to drink wine. Right. Like on vacation, you know, we're more like drinking wine, right? And doing yeah. other things. Like that. So the can thing was just so much more appropriate. So I'm like, yes, let's just tackle this as if the guy that's the vacation guy is the guy making the wine. And so I threw that's it awesome. at Neil and he was on board 100% um, for helping me with the art stuff. And then we have like a whole playful thing with it. The winemaker's name is actually Rowdy Richvale. Rowdy Richvale. And yes. that's what I read about. I'm like, wait, what the, what? Yes. Who is this? But at the same time, I knew you were behind. I'm like, okay, hold yeah. on. This is really cool. And so it's Richvale Wine Co., though, right? Yeah. Is that what it's called? Yeah, so Richvale Wine Co. So the whole thing behind how, where that came from was uh, if you ever play the game, like, what would your porn name be? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it's like uh, the street you grew up on or something, wasn't it? Yes, and your, your first pet's name, right? So mine was Rowdy. The street I grew up on was Richvale. <laughs> We're just, let's pause there. So anyway, ladies and gentlemen, you might not know him as Kurt, but if I said Rowdy Ridgeville, that that might sound a little bit more familiar. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and I got to tell you, like, when I tasted your canned wine, so there's been canned wine from a lot of different, you know, vendors out there. Um, yours was a notch above. Like, I'm like, this is 
good wine. I mean, I, I know that there's a kind of a, a stigma about canned wine in general from some people that want to hold their nose up to it, but it's ready to drink. It chills quickly because, hey, a little science tip, the concentration uh, for heat in aluminum, it's much lower, so you can transfer cool real quick. And then, like, your, your, uh, the white wine, especially, and the quinoa. Oh, my gosh, like a chilled red wine. Huge fan of that stuff. Yeah. Was, and so are those the same wines you're selling at Groundwork, or are they different blends, or, you know, what are they? Yeah, well, up until this vintage, it has basically been – kind of groundwork in a can gotcha uh, yeah and this, this year it, it actually got its own legs um so they the wines this vintage are all their own wines so we actually did pinot noir in the can this year which does nice. very well also chillable and in yes. the, can, the red um and then we did a verdello alberino blend for the white nice which nice. was uh yeah some fruit i got from pomar and um yeah, Albrino was from Moro View and Enda Valley. And, Beautiful. Uh, we were just tasting that uh, last week from uh, Field Recordings. Cool. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so that's the white. And then the pink is Grenache based and a little more red. So, uh, awesome. Yeah. That is so awesome. So, I got to tell you, um, you know, one, I love the canned wine. So, you have groundwork. You have uh, San. Okay, I took German in high school for some stupid reason. So, I'm not going to pronounce it's San Liege. It is. Ah, yeah. there you go. You got it's it. It's on leash. Uh, yeah. And then uh, you obviously also, though, have the Fabulous. Before we jump into the Fabulous, though, I want to ask, are there any other projects that we should know about that you're working on or that you have worked on? Yeah, well, so under the Fabulous umbrella, um, which is a partnership between myself and Andrew Jones. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, we have the Fabulous and we have Tin City Cider. So those, yeah. I did not know because I always knew that there was a not co-branding, but like there would be some marketing. And like if I got something from, you know, like whatever promotion, there would be a 10 city cider element to it. But I just thought, hey, we're neighbors. Let's like, you know, help each other out. But you guys really are partnering with 10 city cider. Like you are partners. And, in it. Yeah. So Andrew and I are the owners of Fabulous and 10 city cider. So it's oh, awesome. Both those projects are our joint collaboration project. Wow. Um, yeah, so for now, you know, it's uh, I've become, I think, a beverage maker or a maker. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know if you can say winemaker. Granted, um, beer, you're not involved with Barrel House, though. That's no, literally a maker. With beer, we, we, we had a little project, actually, that we started, that we have 12 barrels of beer uh, yeah. that um, things didn't quite go like we were planning on. So we're at the point of, like, what are we going to do with those? But... Uh, <laughs> We dipped our toe in that little element for a minute and kind of yeah. pulled out. But uh, you know, <laughs> I, I love drinking beer. Yeah, it's awesome. I feel like especially when we were just talking about canned wine and and also uh, we just got the Fredo. And one thing I love about that is that, hey, we're talking about lower alcohol. We're talking about day drinking, which is like, unfortunately, pretty popular right now because everyone's stuck at home. And um, they need something chilled because it's starting to heat up. And having beer, actually, even even like an IPA, is still like 7%, which is so low for wine. So getting a wine that gets closer to that gives you something finally equivalent. So we love beer at our house as well. It's just, you know, um, I, I don't know. It, it's tough because, like, I love wine, but beer is just, you know, it's so easy to drink when it's hot outside and you just need something refreshing. Seriously. Yeah. Oh. I got a question. Um, how do you feel about seltzer? What's your opinion? Being that you're a beverage maker. Yeah. Seltzer, what's your opinion? Yeah. I mean, I've drank them once in a while. I haven't really got into them as much. I think for me, it got, our rotation's really um, beer, wine, and cider in the house. So, so uh, you know, when I'm going for like the super refreshing, crisp deal, I'm going now at this point to the, the OG cider we make and get that yeah. thing cold on a hot day that's kind of my like go-to so, um, i get the spritzer thing it makes a lot of sense for the yeah. lower alcohol you know you're staying hydrated while you're drinking um it's just something we haven't like transitioned to in this house yet but i mean it makes total sense and the stuff that andrew's doing and the oxy guy is doing i think are really really fun um, nice. yeah that's awesome and 
I got to tell you, like, I have not gotten into the seltzer yet either. I mean, I when I think seltzer, I'm like, I actually like to drink wine next to maybe a sparkling water if I really wanted to do something like that. But at the same time, I totally understand it, too, because you are getting hydrated and still, you know, staying relaxed, if I want to say it, PC. <laughs> right. Um, I got another question before we start tasting, though. Hey, are there yeah. any plans to get uh, Sanglige wines in the East Coast? Or do you have distribution out there? Somebody from the D.C. area, I was curious. Yeah, I think we are We are not in D.C., but um, we are in Massachusetts, um, Maine, Delaware, New York. Nice. Yeah, yeah, we do have some reputation out there, but it's just... Yeah, I'd love to get in D.C. If anybody has a lead for me, let me know. You know what? Let me throw this out here, too. Being that you are a winery, you can ship pretty direct to 48 states or quite a few states, though, can't you, from your winery. So if anybody in D.C. wanted your wine, they could buy it from you, couldn't they? Yeah, we could get it to you. Exactly. I mean, not to, like, call you out there, buddy. Yeah, but yeah. If you really want the wine, <laughs> they could ship it to you. You just got to, you know, go onto their site and buy it from them. So, uh let me ask you now about the Fabulous, though, because the Fabulous you had mentioned is a partnership between you and Andrew. We had Andrew on uh, a couple weeks ago. It was so much fun. Um, he's got so many things going on, just like you do. How did you guys come up with the Fabulous? Because one, it's kind of a show-stopping like design, as well as like you know the wines themselves over deliver. Like it seems like such a solid thing. Like, but how did you come up with it? Where did this come from? Yeah, well, um, I think in the beginning, I was actually uh, looking at, I was being courted by some people in Santa Barbara to open, like, be a winemaker for a kind of a, a Bordeaux project with some money behind it. Okay. And um, things just didn't, weren't going hmm. the way I want them to go. Um, yeah. And I'd kind of been playing a little bit with Cabernet in my cellar, so I had some cab there. And Andrew and I were close already, and so I was just yeah. talking about it with him, and he just looked at me and like, why don't we make cab together? You're already going to do it. And I was literally like, yeah, let's do it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, those first which is exactly was, what I want to happen in Zen City, yeah. but you do, you don't know if that's really what's happening. Like there could yeah. be something else going on, but so this, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. This predates Tin City. So I was still making my really? wine in Santa Maria and, oh. uh, I just had the tasting room in Pismo. Um, yeah, I think, and I don't even know, I think Andrew actually may have already been there, like him and Terezi at Giornata were maybe the only two up there at that point when we started this thing, but um, yeah, that's really how it started, and then, you know, we kind of did a little study of like, you know, what does the $20 cab price point look like, yes. uh, you know, and we did some blind tastings and stuff, and, and we felt pretty pretty good about um, our chances to at least put a wine on the table, those other wines. Yes. Uh, and so we, uh, yeah, we pursued it full bore. And um, yeah, we, how we came up with the deal was we were sitting there one day and it was kind of like, you're brainstorming. And it's like, every wine has a story. Every yes. Has a story, story, fable. Hmm. Boom. Aesop's fables. Yeah. And then we like, that's where we went down that path of doing, you know, so the deal is every wine's a different Aesop's fable. Yes. And, you know, that's, that's kind of where the whole thing brainstormed and, and came together. And the, the partnership's been so awesome because, um, you know, in the beginning, it was like wine that they had a field recordings, wine at Salnese, and we put them together. Yeah. And we did, we did that for a few vintages. And then it became big enough that it, you know, really needed its own space and its own yeah. focus. And so at that point, we kind of how we divide up the day jobs are, you know, Andrew, I'm sure he told everybody sells vines. He still has a day job. You know, he works for, I think the second largest vine nursery in the country. He and didn't mention the size, but we definitely <laughs> talked about that. Yeah. He, so he knows everybody basically from Washington down to Temecula, you know, people that plant grapes, you know, he helps people design vineyards. He works for all the growers. So he handles all the vineyard side of it. He finds yeah. sites for us. He works with all the growers. Um, he calls the picks, like, you know, he kind of handles mm -hmm. all that. And the awesome thing is he knows all these vineyards that no one ever heard of. Yes. Deliver like insane value. That's the thing. You know, off these ranches that are no name, but they're like 
some of the most talented people in the business. Yes. In a place you'd never know. They're like all the little honey holes he knows. So, exactly. And I feel like that is actually, when I think about the minds that, that I've had from you and from Andrew, like I would always describe over deliver. Like they over deliver because we are now used to a price point and the price point to equate to the taste. And so like, you know, when I taste the thing list, I'm like, this is not a 1999 bottle of wine. This is a $40 bottle of wine that I'm tasting right now, but I paid 19 bucks for it. So it's like, you know, but once somebody has it, they're like, yeah, keep it coming. Let's, let's keep going. Because like, it, it just always delivers, especially consistently. Like, um, yes, Simon, honey holes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we, without that, it, the project wouldn't work. So then the wine or the grapes were sent to the winery and then yeah. my team, we do all the winemaking. So I manage all the winemaking side. Um, nice. And then Andrew and I meet up and we do all the blending together. Nice. And then um, after that on like the day to day thing, like I handle more of the admin side and he handles more of the sales side. Awesome. So, uh, uh, actually, well, I definitely like, appreciate I also here on the sales side. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I definitely appreciate the, the sales side lately because you guys have definitely offered some awesome deals. But uh, more than anything though, the winemaking, come on. The winemaking has been so solid and so consistent. Like this is why, like I, when the, the first wines that I started carrying with Bricks and Barrel, uh, Fabulist and Desperado were two of the first two that I started carrying. And I, I still carry them. I'm like, I, I've tried so many other ones. I'm like, these are, st I would still choose these. Like whenever I do tastings, they're just so good. And they deliver for, especially the price. I mean, both, I mean, we had Delia on not too long ago. Love her story. And then her style is so cool. Like the, the types of wines that she does. And then when I go to the Fabulous, I'm like, it's still great. Like my brother, uh, it, the only thing he wants to drink is the Zinfandel. That's all. I and mean, he just, he will only drink the Zinfandel from, from Fabulous. It's just that good. Cool. Yeah, we are huge fans of Elia in this house. We actually, we're in her wine club ourselves. So um, I don't blame you. I can't disagree with anything you said right now. Dude, we just tried the Suter while I was on live not too long ago. It was amazing like i i had had the suitor in a previous vintage but the most recent vintage release that she had for it i forgot what it was it was it was amazing it was so good where like it was balanced but it was still like really bright oh it was i, I don't even have the right words for it because you know my background's in finance and accounting but at the same time like that wine that she does it's so much fun not to mention i can't wait to try the solera project that she's doing like that that sounds really cool the dressmaker Sounds really dude. fun. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. I'm yeah. just saying. Okay. All this to talk about, would we be able to maybe uh, go through the Cabernet and talk about like, hey, what should we be tasting when we have it? Because I have it right here. And, and to answer Michael's question, he answered or asked earlier, hey, what are you drinking? Yeah. Cabernet. Drinking the Cabernet. Uh, but yeah, like, tell me about the Cabernet. Because this is one that uh, you don't, you don't have a Cabernet on your other projects do you this is one of your only cabernets yeah no i mean we so yeah in on the fabulous side we don't do any own stuff so the whole project there is all noble varietals okay um so you know there's no overlap from song niche to fabulous for me so uh but you know i think the king of the noble varietals at least in the states is cabernet so it is the brand was founded on um and you know paso robles grows really great cabernet um I think for a lot of years, a lot of cab from Paso's kind of like went on trucks up north and was blenders for a lot of other stuff. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, it's nice to see it finally getting its own recognition yeah. that it deserves, I think. So, um, totally. you know, to me, w with this wine, the whole object, uh, object of the Fabulous is really to varietally correct wines from the Central Coast, Paso Robles, some stuff, Santa Barbara, a lot of it's Paso, but... So we didn't want to make something huge and unctuous here. We wanted to make hmm. one. Yeah. Was a drinker and you could drink it kind of young. Yeah. Uh, I think to me, the, the prettiest thing about Cabernet, the alluring thing is all that blue fruit you get from it. Hmm. Um, and I just think that, it's, you know, it's very, very enticing. Yeah. Um, we also, on our new oak we use on this, we only use American oak. Hmm. 
And then I'm also very particular about that. I only use Pennsylvania oak. Okay. So yeah. Tell me about that though. Cause I mean like I've heard Hungarian, I've heard hybrid, I've heard French, I've heard American. Yeah. Why did you choose Pennsylvania? What, what, did what's special about Pennsylvania? Different types of American oak. And every time for me, it's just, it's the one that delivers. And it's all mm -hmm. about like bacon and plum. Bacon and, and plum. Yeah. But it's, it's, it seems to be a little bit less aggressive than some other forests. Yeah. Really like the integration of it. Um, so yeah, that's like my one little trick. All the American oak is only Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but other than that, winemaking, you know, we don't do not a lot of tricks on it. You know, we bring the fruit in, it's good fruit. Where's the fruit coming from now? Now is it coming from, it's not coming from the estate or is it coming from the estate now? It is not coming from the estate. So all, all this fruit is, you know, again, little, little spots that Andrew has found from, from his people. And nice. then we do have a couple spots down the other side of the grade um, one of my oldest relationships, Santa Barbara Highlands Vineyard, we do get a little Cabernet out of there that my buddy okay. grows. And then we get a little bit of um, non-irrigated Cabernet from Oro Grande Vineyard called Potrero, which mm -hmm. makes up a majority of the fruit as well in the Zinfandel that your brother likes so much. No way. Okay, that's that awesome. Down there, yeah, that, that we released the whole thing. Um, it's about 40 acres. doesn't produce a bunch it's like a ton and a half per acre it's non-irrigated but yeah yeah also one it's gotta be super concentrated though i mean like if it's not irrigated again speaking to those that may or may not be into wine so if it's not irrigated that means that it's just whatever comes from the sky or maybe soaked up from the ground is yeah. what feeds the grapes right so this is creating small berries really concentrated with would you say what's the sugar sweet bitter what, what kind of things would you expect from a, a grape that's non-irrigated yeah, well, I mean, I think it would depend on where it's at. So this site specifically is in a little bit cooler region because it's in Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. So we typically get a lot of spice out of this site on all of the varietals. Um, we obviously get great concentration. This vineyard also delivers insane pH. So like people like to say a high acid, which translates to low pH. So you get mm -hmm. really good low pH out of that site, spice, concentration. And the cool thing about the cab is because it's in a cooler site, we actually get a little bit of this like green pyrazzini flavor. Huh. Wait, wait, did you say pyrazzini? What's pyrazzini? Yeah, it's like a, it's like a green, um, almost like green olive uh, kind of thing that can come through with Bordeaux varietals a lot. Nice. It's ripe enough. Okay. This is from a cool site, which on its own would be a challenge to make. But because we're blending it with all this other richer Paso cab, uh -huh. kind of is like a little signature... Um, you know, cool little blender. Like I love green flavors into the Bordeaux varietals, like Merlot and Cab. I love that little, you know, green edge to it. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. And thanks for letting me ask you that too. Cause I mean, sometimes I, you know, what's kind of fun too is like, sometimes I ask for the people watching, they might not know. And then sometimes I literally just have no idea. And so I'll <laughs> ask you either way, just to make sure that everybody's following along. There was a question though that somebody threw out there. Um, how long do you leave uh, the Cabernet on oak when you do, uh, it's aged in oak though, right? Is that right? So at, all of the Fabulous wines are barrel aged. Um, you know, a couple of the whites, we do some tank time, but all the reds are okay. 100% barrel. Um, but it is a quick cycle. So all these wines go in a bottle before the next vintage. Yeah. We're typically on about a nine month barrel age cycle with these wines. Yeah. Which is like pretty standard and, and pretty good for ready to drink, Cabernet, Red, whatever. Like those, that's a good cycle. And, and also the proof's in the bottle too. Like it seems to work. <laughs> like as far as like, you know, the aging um, for a bottle, once you have it bottled, do you think these bottles should be enjoyed right away or should they be aged a little bit and, uh, you know, let them, you know, uh, kind of do their own magic yeah. rack or something? Right. I mean, that's always such a tricky one to answer because we try so hard to make sure a wine is ready to drink when we release it. The last thing I want to do would be like, buy this, yeah. but don't open it for a year. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, right. yeah. But, that, that would never happen in this house, by the way. Never. Good, good, good. I think yeah. you're very normal. But, you know, some people, um, you know, like to age wine. I think, yeah. you know, we've, we've gone back through these vintages. We don't have like a ton of them right now. I think the oldest one's an 11. They're all holding amazing. Really? So I think the question is kind of as a consumer, do you, where do you fall on that spectrum of how yeah. you like to drink your wines? Do you like them to show a little bit of age? 
a yep. little bit more of that like brown sugar on the back or do you like them like really fresh and vibrant i mean mm -hmm. up front we're going to give you that but if you age these they will age gracefully nice. and i think you know keep delivering so i i just think huh. you know it's kind of a personal question where like what some people like yeah um, you know i my palate yeah. very i have a very young palate because i spend the majority of my time tasting out of barrels that's true so i'm not like sense. that I'm not a guy that can pontificate on like 10 year old wines because yeah. it's, I, I'm basically usually drinking wines that are not even year old. No, so, no. You know, how it goes that way. Yeah. That's interesting. And that makes so much sense too, which is like what I would want you to have because yeah, you have to be able to taste the wines the way they're supposed to taste less than a year old so that we, once we get it, you know, get kind of what you would expect us to enjoy. So no, I, I feel like you're exactly where you should be. I don't want to jump to something, but like, do you have any other fabulous wines with you too? If we want to taste something, I have. Yeah, you can see these guys right behind me. I can taste. No, I've got the, these guys. I've, yeah, I've got the same as you. I have the Merlot and Zin as well. Nice. Hey, you know what? Let's try another one. You name it. Yeah, I'll pull one from right behind me. What would you yeah, like yeah. to try? All right. Um, let's let's go with the Zin. Let's go with your brother's brother's choice. I love it. All right, cool. And Jeff, you know, I did send you a couple bottles, so I hope uh, you taste. I, I I mentioned before, but at the end of this, I'm gonna have Jeff join us. Um, just me, actually. Kurt, after I say bye to you, I'll, I'll have my brother join and give us his opinion about this thing, so. All go. right, so, um, Zinfandel has actually become one of my newer favorite bridles. Nice, so, okay, it wasn't to begin with, but it is now, then. So yeah, you've grown well, into so the I've only been, let's see, I've only been making Zin for like five years. Okay. Um, and you've been doing the, the first uh, wine you made, was that the offering or what was it? I'm sorry, what was that, Trevor? What, what was the first wine that you made back in 2000, what, five or six or something like yeah. that? What, well, the, the first wine I made was um, a half a ton of fruit from the Alta Mesa Vineyard in Santa Barbara. Okay. Osh in 2003. Um, so that was my first wine. Uh, my second wine was a GSM from. Okay. Harbor Highlands Vineyard. Uh, my third wine was a Grenache Syrah. I couldn't find any more Vedra that year. Uh, <laughs> I see you at the GS. Yeah, the GS. And then nice. uh, 06 was the f debut of the offering. Nice. Yeah. Offering is awesome. That is something that when I think of, no, no offense, but when I think of you, I might need to get to know you better. I think of the offering. I'm like, that reminds me of you because I'm like, that. That is like sans leash. Like yeah. that's that's what I think of. I mean, the design of the bottle, the taste is bold, just like the design. It's so good, so good. So anyway, all that to say. Sorry, we can go back to, to Zinfandel though, because yeah, I'm tasting the Zinfandel. Tell me about this. Okay, cool. So Zinfandel is uh, I learned, you know, is a steep learning curve to making Zinfandel. I don't know how many of you guys have experienced Zinfandel in a vineyard setting, but I know I haven't. Very, very typical if you go grab a cluster of Zinfandel in a vineyard, and I can't make this up, uh, within one cluster, you will have berries that are green, berries that are perfectly ripe, and berries that are pruning up or turning into raisins. Oh my gosh. Okay, so you got to imagine this. So like you're going out there, you know, my job is I go out typically and I'll taste grapes, kind of track how they're doing, and you know, we got to figure out when we're going to pick them. So Zimbandel is all over the place. So like, when do you choose to pick? If you pick just off the middle berries, you know, is the green going to be too much? Yeah. Is it going to be too much? So it's, first you have that challenge. Yeah. The second challenge is a majority of this wine is from a non-irrigated site in sandy soils. So not only is Zimbandel difficult to call the pick on, but we have a vineyard here that I, we can't turn the water on. So you've got to be out there tasting it. If a heat wave will come, yeah. you can torch everything in literally like two days because the sun in sand, the sun hits the grapes on the way down, yep. reflects off the sand, gets them again on the way back up. Oh my gosh. So, you know, and you can't turn the water on to save them from that. So this vineyard site, it can be like terrifying. You know, you're getting into the end of the season. Like, I don't want to miss the window. Yeah. 
too ripe, you know, you're gonna end up making wine that 19. Okay, this sounds oh. so much more dramatic than anybody would probably imagine. I mean, granted, there is a scorpion on the front of the bottle. So I mean, like that is a good intro to how dramatic yeah. this is. But at the same time, like then how, because I've had this for a couple of vintages. It's always been just amazing. But at the same time, like, then how do you guys do it? You just watch it like a hawk? You got to watch it like a hawk. But again, it's like you have to react to the weather too, right? So it's like sometimes weather doesn't cooperate. And no, you just can't find a crew to go out in the middle of nowhere and pick something like, you know, if, like, oh, God, we got to pick it tonight. That's not happening. So it's just a learning curve, you know, and, and we've kind of figured out to stay a little bit ahead of it. Hmm. Um, to be proactive instead of reactive. So, yeah. you know, the other thing about it is once we'll get it in, we'll think it's like so many bricks and it'll just soak up and keep going because there'll be all the sugar from the raisin stuff that like, yeah. so, you know, we, you know, we've learned some lessons with that. I think the first year I made it, it didn't finish fermentation till January 6th, um, which is pretty yeah. bad. Usually well, we're when done did you pick it? When, the, when did you harvest it? Uh, we probably harvested it in October like late oh. October. So usually we're done with all ferments by Thanksgiving at the latest. Yeah. Yeah. This, that was, that was a tough one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've learned. I like, I like actually that was a really good positive spin. That was a learning curve. Like yeah. you learned a lot. You learned, Hey, totally. God, that sounds like a long expensive learning curve, but yes, that sounds cool. But I love the thing I love about this Zen that we have is that um, mm. that site behaves so different than most central coast stuff. A lot of the Zen, you have this like East Paso, really yeah. rich, jammy Zins, which are great. Yes. But they this delivers this racy, racy acid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's more like the Sonoma Coast Zen. I'm mm -hmm. a sucker for spice on my red wines. Yes. We get, spice yes. Sucker, we get insane acidity. Yep. I mean, which makes it a food wine. I've learned this from my friend Gary, who's been on a couple times. He, he's a Psalm. And the, and the cool thing is, as a Psalm, though, he. He actually doesn't sound too nerdy when I talk to him. I actually understand everything he's saying. And uh, one thing he says all the time is that acid equals food. He's like, if you got acid, you're going to really enjoy the food that you're going to be drinking with. And when I drink the Zinfandel from the Fabulous, I'm like, acid, spice, food. I'm like, just give it to me. You know, like whatever it is that you are cooking, like I can normally like know I'm going to enjoy it with the Fabulous Zin. It just has such a good... Um, I don't know, I, pairing quality, I guess is what you could call it, but like it has such a good acidity to it that when I try other, I've tried other things um, in Paso, Zinfandels, and they do, they're just so big, not much acid, and just a lot of alcohol. I'm like, hey, this is great if I want to forget something. But if I don't, like, then I'm going to want to go with something else and maybe pair it with, yeah, yeah. the Fabulous Zin. Totally. And it's totally. You know, we, you can't take any credit for that. It's just, it's the fruit, you know, it's the site, it's the fruit. You um, humble winemaker. Yes, yeah, you can't take some credit. Cause literally we just went through how hard it is to make this wine. We literally just went through that, Kurt. Like you literally yeah, but, told us, but still. I could have the same challenge without the acidity, you know, the acid is there the site. So, you know, that's, that's the beauty of it. But my other thing that I've learned to love about the Zinfandel or my, my, my thought on it is like, I think it's our American varietal. Like mm. Everybody claims everything else. Zinfandel is ours. Like this is our American heritage varietal. Like that's really well. You think about all the other ones; they all have some European home history. Like Zin is us. That is awesome. Now, there's Zin from like they okay. Then tell me really quick. What is old vine Zen then? Because like when people say old vine Zen, old vine this, old blah blah blah, blah I'm like Zen is always brought up. That's old from old where then? Because I'm like they're bringing it from another country to America. Uh, are they making it in other places or what? Yeah, I mean I know there's a lot of old Zen like Turley. The Turley stuff is yeah insane, right. So I mean, I'd be afraid I would just like say everything wrong did this, but I'll tell you something really interesting. So the winemaker for Turley. Uh, Tegan, uh, I think his last name is Pasolacqua, but Tegan, he is a part of something that's like the old vineyard society. Okay. He goes through all these old vineyard sites and catalogs where they came from, who planted them and did this. He does it with a guy, uh, Morgan Twain Peterson from Bedrock. Okay. Uh, they do it together. So, um, 
if we looked up on their stuff, we would get all those answers. But I, I, I'm not sure for sure. But you know what? I won't lie though. When I do think about uh, Paso, though, I do think Paso, and I think of Zen, I think of GSM, and I think of some of these more bold varietals. But at the same time, the cool thing is, like when I try the things from the Fabulous, they introduce me to things like alternatives to what I would say is the standard version of that. Like there's not the GSM obviously at the Fabulous, but you have. Uh, a Cabernet, you have a Zinfandel, and then you also do have, um, you know, a few other wines that I feel like are um, more of the uh, approachable, like ready to drink wines, man. Like they're just, they're awesome. And I only have a couple more minutes and I gotta say bye. So I gotta ask you, we don't necessarily, you know, maybe just a sip, but how did you do this with the Merlot? Because this thing's amazing. Um, seriously, yeah. like it has been, my go-to is like my brother loves the Zinfandel. I have been the biggest fan of the Merlot, and actually, I did not love Merlot for the longest time because you know, in all honesty, like I think of Merlot, I thought of my, you know, whatever the older couple down the street or something like that. But would you mind telling me just a little bit about the Merlot, and then yeah, you know, so, all right. So this is a I got to give all the credit to Andrew on this. Um, so I like you was not. I just hadn't drank much Merlot. It just wasn't something that I'd been into. And so when we get in these situations where we go in and we, we lease vineyards, you take the whole vineyard. Yeah. And so oh, no. this, vineyard, oh, man. this foundation of this Merlot was primarily a cab vineyard with some Merlot. It's called Hinterland. And so I remember the first harvest we got it, and uh, Andrew calls like, okay, the first truck's going to come on Tuesday. I said, oh, great. So the truck came. We processed it. Then he calls me, how'd it go? Everything went good. We got it, you know, it's in the tank. We're going to be good. Okay, second truck's coming <laughs> on Thursday. I say, excuse me? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what? I'm like, how much Merlot are we making? He's like, don't worry, it'd be fine. I'm like, oh my <laughs> God, what are we doing? You know, it was like the stigma of Merlot with sideways and everything. Like, oh God, yeah. what are we doing here? And I'll tell you what, my, about seven days into it, after I received the first fruit, it was into fermentation. The entire winery smelled like blueberry muffin. Oh. And I'm okay, we're going to be just fine. And I've learned, <laughs> you know, a lot of times that Merlot can actually rival in, in a lot of times even be better than Cabernet from the same sites. So, you know, I think it's, you know, it's a beautiful wine. Um, it is. I, I, you know, I love the Merlot and, I, you know, we sell quite a bit more Cabernet, but I think if you had the two side by side, you know, Emma Lowe's deserves to be sitting right next to the cab. You know what? I would actually throw that out there too. I mean, when I, so I, I'm enjoying all three of these tonight. They all have their own thing. And the other thing I would throw out to people too is that like, hey, when you do get these wines, because I know every single one of the people that are watching right now will now buy these wines after talking to you. Um, but when you do, open them up, take a sip right away, go for it but then leave it open for a little bit. Cause I did that with the Cabernet and all of these. Oh my gosh. Like they open up and they turn into new wines. They really do. Like they have so much going on when it comes down to it. And the Merlot, especially I'm like, yes, that I feel like turns into something so cool whenever I have it. Like I, I am, I, I love hearing that that's, that was your like hesitation to be in with, but like, that was my hesitation to try it and even to carry it. Like, I was like, I don't know. Is anybody going to buy it? But every, actually, everybody that has bought the Merlot before buys it again. I can't say that with every other bottle I have, but everybody that has bought the Merlot, they always buy at least one more bottle. Like, they'll try it. Maybe, like, we have this thing called the, the Brown Bag Mystery bottle. They're like, if you want, pay this much. I'll just throw a bottle in. I'll, I'll put this bottle in. They always end up getting it again. <laughs> I'm like, hey, this is a good one. I'll, I'll send this one to you. It always works out. I don't know how it does it, but still, like, uh, the Merlot, I feel like, converts people. Especially if they, they just look at the label, too, and they don't read that it's Merlot. I feel like that really helps out, too. Like, this is such a cool label. Yeah. And let me ask you this. So we have a couple more minutes. Who does your designs? Because your designs and your branding is just so cool, man. Like, who, do, who does it? Yeah, well... When we first started out with the Fabulous brand, we worked with a local company in San Luis Obispo that's called Makers and Allies. Okay. Um, and Andrew and I had a long history with uh, the owner, Sarah, there. Um, we actually worked with her when she worked for our friend, Josh, who did some marketing okay. stuff. And then Sarah went out and started her own company. So she helped us get this brand all off the ground. Like we we're doing all that brainstorming and this and that. 
like she was involved in all that. And then since then, um, we have, you know, we have so many projects going on between Andrew and I, we have our in-house like design now. Um, Good. Awesome, awesome young lady who went to Cal Poly, um, was working with us while she was going to school there, graduated, and now we kind of have a deal that she has her own company, but she only services our, you know, five companies. Awesome. Uh, Wait, is that the one that I log into whenever I need a bottle shot? Is like, what's the name of it? Not Plow or something like that. Is uh, it? Well, Plow is kind of the thing we've made for our sales side, but her company's called Berlandieri. I have not heard of that one. That one is brand new to me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Lauren, she's she's a genius. That's awesome. Well, yeah. she's done an awesome job. Yeah. And so, okay, being that we only have a couple minutes left, and I want to make sure to still give some time. I, my brother wanted to, to, to say something at the end of this. Okay, I have a few questions I've been asking people every, every single time. Um, one, like, okay, in your opinion, Kurt, like, how, you know, through this whole thing, what do you think we could be doing as a community, people that love wine, as well as just like people in general to help each other during this hard time of, you know, COVID and stuff. Any opinion? We've had a few different answers from, you know, Andrew, Bailey and others, but what's your opinion? Yeah. Um, I mean, my thing's like, it's not really necessarily just wine related. Sure. But I think, you know, all of us are being like tried. Yeah. And like emotionally, uh, mentally, um, relationally. Yeah. And I think first and foremost, like, accept that that's going on mm -hmm. and have grace for yourself that like certain mm -hmm. days maybe aren't your best days or certain hours aren't your best hour. Yeah. Like, you know, be willing to like acknowledge that we're going through something and forgive yourself. Yeah. And then once you can get that down, start to do that for others. Cause everybody's going through the same stuff and you know, we just have moments. We're just not being our best people and best selves, but we just need to, you know, have grace for ourselves first and then grace for others. Like that's, I think that's, that's what I'd, I'd like to say. And then, selfishly like i gotta say that hits home too because for me i'm working from home as well as you know with that my kids are going to school at home my wife is working and trying to teach like there's a lot more grace that's needed for everybody honestly like yeah. and so i i totally agree with you. i know that we've talked about different things that you could do to contribute to the world outside but i think that's really perfect for being able to give yourself some grace at home and you know help out the world you know within your own home so kurt thanks man hey uh also um where, where can people find you where they where could they be you know following you i mean san liege we have fabulous we have groundworks richvale follow them on instagram anything else we should know about yeah i mean we've got uh we got san liege instagram we got fabulous instagram we got groundwork instagram tin city Cyber instagram richvale instagram there you uh, go you know, we have Facebook presence as well. And then, um, you know, we also, we have the websites too. If you want to go on and join the mailing list on the websites. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we can, we can inform you plenty of ways, whatever's your jam to get information. We, we've got totally. it. Totally. And, and you know what? I got to hand it to you too. You have been doing such a great job. I think of rewarding your wine club members. Like I've seen some of the, these like premium releases, like you have some really cool stuff. So everybody watching, Go check out their Instagram as well as their websites. And hey, Kurt, I'm going to throw this out there too. Like when it comes down to it, like I know that I've seen so many people in the wine industry kind of having to shift their, um, I guess their marketing, their, their approach and like to direct consumer. And so I, I guess like, I just really appreciate like you coming on and, I don't know, hanging out and being able to talk to the people that love your wine and like giving us the backstory and everything, man. Cause like, I know it's so much more than just a bottle of wine. And at the same time to know how much more only comes from talking to you. So thanks, man. Really appreciate it. I, I appreciate the opportunity. It's actually like pretty fun. So good. You talk your ear off. So like, you know, thank you for having me on. No, hey, my pleasure, and I can't wait for the chance to come out and see you. I mean, granted, if j &L throws another one of those wine tasting events and I can hang out with you until the end of the night, once again, All right. that would be great. Let's do it.
Let's I'd be it. down. Hey, I think they're on actually. Yeah. Hey, uh, Amanda, if you could put put a note in, uh, that would be great. <laughs> hey, Kurt, hey, really appreciate it, man. All right. Thank you. I'll Kurt. talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye. Guys, thank you so much for, for tuning in. I only have a couple of minutes, but I wanted to be able to give my brother a chance to. And so he, he's been texting me this entire time. He's loved being able to, to, to watch and to taste. He's been tasting the entire time with us. But you might not know this. I sell wine. He sells coffee. So he's up early. He sells coffee for his community down in Southern California. And um, he also has a great palate. So I'd love to be able to give a chance to, for him to get his opinion on the fabulous. Let's just go ahead and go to Jeff, though, really quick and see if we can't hear, um, you know, what it is that uh, that he is thinking about the, the fabulous. All right, Jeff. Hey, you know, and again, guys, he's got a great palate. He used to do, you know, I, I think a lot of public speaking. So yeah he was asleep yep he was asleep all right well hey um we'll try it again some other time yeah Next week, guys, Amplos is going to be on. They are one of the first wineries in California that, so biodynamic, organic wines. Um, not only that, but guys, I would love to be able to tell their story too. So we're going to be talking to them next week. And the week after that, we're we'll doing Trivia Night again. So please, if you haven't, make sure to follow us. Also, all the wines that we are talking about tonight are for sale in a bundle. Three wines, $55. Get on it, guys. I would love to be, I, I sold out last week. I would love to be able to sell to these guys again. They over deliver. This is not a $20 bottle of wine. It's much closer to a $40 or $50 bottle of wine that just costs $20. So please go on, try it out. And also, if you have anybody that would enjoy wines from California, tell them about Bricks and Barrel. We're trying to spread the word so that we're able to help these wineries out. Thank you, guys. It's been so much fun. And I can't wait to do this again with you guys next week. I keep doing it again and again because apparently you guys keep coming back. So thank you. All right, guys. Have a great night. Can't wait to see you again next week. Check out Bricks and Barrel. Got some great deals on there right now when it comes down to the Fabulous. Please, please, please check it out. Uh, we only have a limited supply, even though we just got resupplied by JNL. Talk to you guys later.